less stress, more time, more money. Welcome to the Cash Flow Contractor Deep Dive. Good afternoon, Martin. Good afternoon, Khalil, and hello to our intern, Ethan, who's a constant has to write down everything we say and repeat all the important stuff. Hold yeah. on, I got a what? <laughs> well, um, man, these, these episodes are fun, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. It's so, um, thank you everyone for joining. Excited to continue to talk about topics, um, in the four areas of business. Uh, I think it's really helpful to have this framework and, um, yeah, I think the four areas are, um, really have helped me as a business owner, uh, keep things clearly organized. Just if I ever have an issue, I can look at the four areas, see where it's at and just think through it a little bit more, uh, strategically. And so I, I, I hope that you've been enjoying this. Um, Martin, what are those four areas again? Four areas of business. Uh, every business has to deal with guiding the business getting the business, doing the business, and administering the business. And uh, guiding is leadership, goals, plans, culture, accountability, incentives, so on. Getting the business is marketing and sales. Doing the business, which will be our topic today, is delivering whatever it was you sold. And administering the business is everything else. As I like to say, it's all the things you never thought of or never heard of when you started business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, excited to get into doing the business. Um, and, you know, we've probably said this a million times, but uh, most contractors start their business because of this area, right? right. Like this is what they're good at. This right. is what they, you know, if they're putting in countertops, they this is what they know better than anyone, right? Right. Um, they're building homes. This is what they do. Um but yeah, tell us, I know today you've got a story for us, um, which is actually really interesting. I'm excited to hear it. So right. uh, well, go ahead and share that with us, Martin. It's really interesting. There was a guy named Derek Sievers who wrote a book called Anything You Want. It's a short little book. I recommend you get it and you can read it in one evening. But this guy was really bright and he was a musician, not a magician, a musician, as in played the guitar. And he made CDs. And, but he was also just interested in all kinds of things. And so he would sell his CDs at gigs. Uh, so whenever he was in front of a crowd, he would sell his CDs, but it was pretty limited access to a market. Well, he'd heard about the internet back in the early nineties. And so he got interested and he got on and created a website and started selling his, uh, CDs on a, on the website. And well, his musician buddies came to him and asked, would he sell their CDs also? And uh, he said, build your own. They said, we don't know how to build a website. So he said, okay, sure. So he started selling CDs online. And just to give you a quick picture of what he accomplished, he built his business to 22 million annually in sales. And uh, he was the first acquisition by Apple iTunes. Now I may have that wrong. You might've been second, but it's in the book. So he was kind of the founder of, Apple iTunes. So great success story, right? Well, not really, because this guy absolutely hated running a business. Now, this isn't strictly contracting, but it's the same kind of thing. He had to make all the decisions, and he was in his office working on his next thing he was interested in. and People were bothering him all the time, coming in and asking questions. So one day, he just had had it, and a guy came in and asked him a question. He said, come with me. So he went out in the warehouse, and got up on a soapbox and told everybody to gather around. He said, this is the question. This is my answer. This is why I answered that way. Do you guys have any questions? Well, when they did, when he was through answering any questions, he said, I don't ever want to hear that again. So within 30 days, he, it was crickets in his office. Nobody was asking him anything. So just by deciding he went out there and got rid of all those headache problems and delegated or abdicated as as we'll talk about a little bit later those duties to his team so uh, it just shows it can be done there needs to be incentive um, so that you're not the one having to do all the production 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of any business owner, but especially contractors, they get that all the time. The questions, right? right. Questions, questions, questions. Um, and it's hard to get over that, uh, hard to get past it. And sometimes it just feels like it's never ending. Well, I think one of the, one of the things that makes contracting so hard is that every day is different. If if you're a manufacturer, you can narrow down your product and processes, and which is what we'll be talking about. But they can uh, kind of refine what you do, and you do the mm-hmm. same thing more than once. In contracting, you might be a concrete contractor and know how to do contract or concrete, but every job is going to be different. People aren't right. there when they said they would be. The customers are calling. That's not what they understood. So mm-hmm. contracting has its own special headaches. Yeah. So we're talking about doing the doing the business, and you know, there's a lot of different things that go in, involved in that, and it obviously does depend on what type of contracting you're doing. But there are some things across the board that still apply in doing the business yes. uh, to every contractor and. Uh, we'll go through several of those. I'm going to list some of them out right now. Uh, performance, meaning like, you know, how, how you deliver your product, how efficient are you, how consistent is it, how's the quality, um, constraints, like what your capacity is, workflow, uh, who does what by when, basically, uh, management structure, uh, whether, you know, you're in HubSpoke management or circular management, which we'll talk about more in depth today, um, your org chart would go under this uh, if you even have one and if you do have one uh, if it's useful for you and then um, the big one that we'll dive into deeper today is really systems uh, really in a nutshell removing yourself from the company uh, while things still get done properly so um, excited to get into each of these Martin and uh, the first one that we're going to go into is that performance area so right. well, what if- do you typically see well, actually, hold on. Before we go into all of these, what's what do you typically see contractors struggle with out of all these things? All of them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> but in what ways, you know? Well, uh, I'm just kind of over having dealt with hundreds of contractors and been one myself. I call it the static electricity. You wake up in the morning and you have these, these all these, you, you know, an abundance of individual discrete to that job problems, like it rained on the place where you're going today and the plumber's not been to the place where you're going next. So, so you have all those problems, but then you also have to understand how to bid jobs. Um, you have to have some help. Uh, in other words, you have to be able to delegate to people so that it's not all on you. Um, you have to, it's part of the administration, but you, you also walk around wondering where your cash is and will you get mm-hmm. paid in time to, to pay materials to get off credit hold so that your suppliers will give you the materials you need. So basically the biggest problem I see is just kind of a chaos in the mind. Mm-hmm. And we need to calm that uh, and trust that we can hand something off to maybe our superintendent or project manager, or even the guys on the job and trust at some level that things will get done without your personal attention and having to be yeah. there all the time. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think that's the that's the biggest thing is that there's not a lot of trust. I see so many contractors right. that still want to get involved in every little thing. Right. Um, and that just, it's too much to bear. Right. Um, I've, I, I can't tell you how many people I've met that are just so stressed out by their business and it affects every area of their life. Right. Well, and it's the opposite of Derek Seavers. He he didn't want to be involved in anything. <laughs> and he, and he Which it can be a good thing at yeah. times. Well, it's it's the goal. I mean, if we think back to our first episode, we talked about the goal of what we're doing here is to create a profitable business that can work without the owner's constant attendance. And those are two different things. Being profitable is one thing and then being profitable without having to be there is another. So mm-hmm. that's that's where we're heading. And you can't can't get there if you're doing everything yourself. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about performance. Okay. And I think that for for this area, you know, we're talking about delivery, efficiency, consistency, quality. Um, typically what I see with contractors is the smaller they are, the easier these things are. And 
really then the medium size, whenever the, the owner's still trying to do everything, that's when these things right. really struggle. Um, and then beyond, I mean, it can, it can get better, obviously, uh, as you grow, as you take on a different mindset of delegation, um, these things can be improved, especially with systems. Um, what do you typically see? Well, you, you brought up a really good point, and I think we need to do an episode on it in the future. But first, let's define what performance is. And performance really is delivering what you sold on time on on budget. That's, mm-hmm. that's really what performance means. So you've got something concrete or some things concretely to work on, uh, the cost, the budget, the time, and whatever it was you told your, your customer. But you mentioned something in passing there. You said for small contractors, it's generally easier uh, because they are on top of the jobs. They can have them in their head and they can actually yep. show up and look at things. Uh, and on the other end, large contractors uh, make enough margin, enough gross profit on their jobs to hire project managers to step right. in for them. And the thing that we, we can probably do another episode on, but i got to mention here, is the in-between. And that's yep. the point. So you start out as a plumber and you're driving the truck and doing all the work. And then you say, well, I'm, this is wearing me out. I can't grow. I can't do anything. So I'm going to hire a guy. Well, when you hire a guy to help, what happens? Does that reduce your problems? Or not, and oh, typically, it increases. yeah, typically it increases your problems. You have to manage that person, um, tell them what to do, have them show up. You got to see that they showed up. They're going to call in sick and things, and yeah. then they're also going to mess things up that you now have to go fix. So it is very, very common, and and I think listeners need to be aware of this, whichever stage you're in, that it's at one level of being. It's not easy, but manageable when you're a sole proprietor uh, on, on the big side, it's manageable because you have help managing. And it's in that middle period that I call the push through when I talk to clients, when you've hired help and it costs you money and you're doing more. And as a result, you have more problems. And like Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. You <laughs> have to recognize that you're in that position that you're in the push through and you have to keep going until you reach a level of profitability or cash flow that you can hire some actual real help. So that, that wasn't necessarily the main point of doing the business, but that was really a great point because yeah, I know a- there are people out there right now who are in that push through and thinking, you know, I'm going to fire everybody and go back to driving the truck. But yeah. of course the problem with that is you'll never be a profitable business that can work without you if you're doing all the work. Well, and I think also there's each, each stage of your your company, of your business is going to have its own set of push throughs. But that is definitely that one right there where you're literally in between training employees, um, you know, selling the jobs, doing the jobs, building systems. All, I mean, every little thing is on Chasing you. Chasing around only. trying to collect cash. Of yeah. course, nobody listening I mean, ever has to do that. So never mind. <laughs> that's that is like the and shout out to the push through podcast jeff finney um who really talks about that specifically for manufacturers woodworkers um just the push through aspect for for running the business of a woodworking company uh if you ever want to check that on wherever you listen to podcasts um so yeah it's obviously easier when you're smaller to you know make these promises and deliver on them um what I mean, why why do you think it is that it's so much more difficult when you have employees for to trust them to fulfill those promises? I know there's several things that I can think of, and we'll talk about some of them with systems. But uh, why do you think it is that um, you know I promise that this job is going to get done on time, on budget, at this quality, and then I have my employees go do it, and then all sorts of problems come into place? Oh. <clears throat> the uh, the reasons are legion. It starts with hiring. Um, yeah. Did you hire a heartbeat or did you hire somebody with skill and talent? Mm-hmm. If you hired somebody with skill and talent, did they also bring the right kind of attitude or are they troublemakers? Did they disrupt your company? So it starts with who we have on our team and then it's training. Do they know mm-hmm. what you want done and how you want it done? So it leads into that level that goes to follow up. I mean, the, the reasons uh, are, are just legion. Uh, yeah. how, to, how to hold people accountability, how do they know what to do, 
uh, when to do it, how do you communicate with them. Um, anyway, there, there are just so many reasons uh, that bringing on employees often brings on a lot of problems rather than solving problems. No, oh, absolutely. And I, I, honestly, I think the biggest one, when you don't, I think it, it does start with hiring, but regardless of who you hire, systems will make that easier. Oh, yeah. If you have a way that it's done and you do training on those systems, then you have a, the, the other big thing is the communication issue, not just with the customer itself, but internally, hey, we sold this job. This is exactly what we're doing for this job. Even just a five minute yeah. recap, that, some, that doesn't happen enough. And um, then letting them go with systems to go and execute on what you've actually promised and they actually hear it from the horse's mouth right. rather than just assume. Um, I think with these things like language is such a big issue. Um, if I started speaking to you in French or Arabic, uh, whatever, you're not going to, you're most likely not going to understand what I'm saying. And when you hire someone, they have their own language of what this system means, uh, their own idea of what this word means. Um, and you've got to make sure that you are communicating the right language to the right people, um, from the beginning. So I yeah, think that's well, I probably the add, biggest reason I would add English. Um, to your list of languages. And if anybody yeah, thinks true. that, I can't remember exactly, but Paul Volcker had a quote like, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I don't think you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. Anyway, it's so confusing, it's hard to remember. But here's a way to test for it. <laughs> I've never heard that. When you next meet, uh, when you're next giving instructions to your foreman or an employee or somebody, or you're talking things over, when you're through, stop look at them and say, tell me what I just said. And you will be shocked because yeah. no matter how clear you were, uh, occasionally it happens, they get it. But uh, especially if it's, if they're new people, they didn't yeah. get it. And that's a way to check for it, uh, to see if you've been clear and whether, and it's not their fault necessarily. Uh, yeah. Just like you said, different language. Well, and if you don't have a foreman, if they're not that big yet, or you don't have another employee yet, Go and do the same exercise with your wife or with your child. <laughs> uh, you'll get the same same result. Don't yep. don't worry. No, my wife understands um, me perfectly. She can finish my sentences <laughs> and, yeah. and sometimes does. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So, uh, okay, let's talk about um, on time um, with delivery. Okay. You know, a lot of a lot of contractors. That's a bit, or you know, customers really care about timing. Of, of the work. What, um, what tips do you have for contractors around time? Well, it's going to rain on your job, right? And the general is going to tell you the sheet rocks up and you can go wire and the sheet rock is not up and you can, mm -hmm. well, you've wired before that, but finish out. Uh, so, so things happen. And the thing most about time is, is that you can set in systems and processes to confirm where you're going and schedules and so on. But one of the biggest things about time and timing with your clients is to set expectations and manage them early. Contractors mm -hmm. more than anybody else are subject to all these vagaries of weather and other people and availability of parts and things like that. So manage the expectations when you're promising times, um, especially if you're working for the public, so that they understand that if it rains on the day you're supposed to be at their house or building, uh, and you have to go somewhere else, that doesn't mean you necessarily get to come back the next day. You've now on another job and you have to finish it and it might push them back a week. There are all kinds of things that you can put in, in your expectations, uh, such as if you fail to make the selection of the brick color that by such and such a date doesn't mean that you get it the next day because you decided a day late. It means that it might be two weeks because you have to go do another job. So on yeah. time, um, lots of things that we can do on that, but I think one of the most important is managing the expectations of your customer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think a great thing for that, um, for really any business owner that, you know, managing customer expectations is huge, but, um, you know, have a little sheet of like, Hey, this is what you can expect. You know, we're, huh. we'll never be at your job site past 5 PM or 6 PM, whatever you want to say, or we'll never show up before six in the morning. Um, we'll, we'll always, we'll never wear, you know, 
muddy boots inside your house or I don't know, whatever you want to say. Um, but, but just put a list of expectations and like, Hey, we, we respond within 48 hours on emails or something like that. If you're not, right. if you're not at the computer, yeah, just I think, find ways of setting those expectations. And usually people will understand if you've done that up front. Yeah. And I, I think you, you, uh, touched on, we call it an expectations or a positioning document, but you started it out right. We, the contractor will not walk with muddy boots and we'll never be there before HOA says we can start work and we'll never be after five and those things. And then put a section in on what the customer is going to do. We yes, expect we will absolutely. be paid within two days of, or at the time of presentation of the invoice, we get 50% up front. Uh, we will respond or you will respond with choices uh, otherwise of material and colors and whatever it is mm-hmm. uh, by such and such a time, or you understand and acknowledge it will delay your project. So as everybody knows, everybody listening who's dealt, especially with, well, dealt with the public, whether, whether it's commercial or residential type public, everybody knows the problems and the things that pop up all the time and the misunderstandings and you can manage your expectations uh, by putting them in a document and going through them one at a time and say, do you understand? Do you understand getting initial? And this is in addition to your contract, uh, contracts are legal documents. A lot of people not real comfortable and don't fully understand what they're reading. But if you give them a sheet of paper with the, such things as we just talked about and have them initial it, they can see that, um, oh yeah, we did talk about that. There's some of them are still going to complain, but at least yeah. we've got the high ground. I think another thing just with delivery and expectations, I think for a lot of small contractors, um, they care so much about winning the job and they care so much about uh, getting the deal that they over promise. And you've got to under promise and over deliver. Um, you're just setting yourself up for failure. If you're over promising, um, you're, you're going to end up being not on budget or yep. losing all of your margin. Um, or, and you're going to end up delayed and then you're going to end up having all these issues. You're going to be even more stressed out and you've got to take a step back and realize, Hey, there will always be another deal. Um, there will always be opportunities to do work, uh, as long as you really seek them out. So don't, um, that, that only gets you into trouble when you start over promising. And usually, you know, Donna Miller calls it the, the knowledge curse where, you start out, you know, you're an expert at what you do, right? You're a great contractor. You're level 10 at one out of 10, uh, you know, everything. And then whenever you're talking to the customer, especially like a residential homeowner, maybe another contractor, it's different, but with another homeowner, um, you know, they're at a level one. And so what you end up doing is you start to try to talk to them at a level at a lower level so that they can understand what you're saying. So maybe you're talking to them at like a five. Well, you still haven't gotten down to one. And that (laughs) gap from one to five is that knowledge curse. And really, I think that it's that knowledge curse that gets you in trouble with overpromising because you think they understand so much of it that you've got to overpromise all these things because that's how you would want it done as a contractor or whatever it is. And uh, you're worried about the pricing because if they knew how how easy that was or whatever, then they wouldn't pay that much for it. But if you would just let go of that knowledge uh, curse and just go down to level one and be real and educate, but be yourself and stop trying to be someone that you're not, you'll you'll be on time. You'll be on budget. You'll be able to fulfill, you know, the promises that you make. Yep. Yeah. So uh, with, with budget, uh, and I want to move through these a little bit faster, but I did want to take time on this one. With budget, um, I know you're really passionate about this, Martin, with contractors, and we can talk about bidding strategies and all these different things. But you know, what are your big tips for just being on budget? Well, it's it has a little bit to do with efficiency and the the big tips tips, and we have uh, some short episodes on this. But is is bidding your jobs so that you can make not only pay all your expenses but also make a target profit, and if you can't you don't take that job. Uh, there's a maturity level. There's a confidence level. When you finally start doing that, as you alluded to just a little while ago, you are not bidding to get the job. Sales is not the reason to be in business. Profit Amen. 
and cash are the reasons to be in business. So that's that's one thing is have a realistic budget that you can actually do because if you're mm-hmm. upside down in a job, it, it, it gets worse. It's not like <laughs> I'm going to go spend the last few thousand dollars and get out of this thing. It's like, oh, I'm going to do that later. I'm going to try to cheap it out. You get more problems. But assuming that you bid something correctly, uh, we're talking about budget means that we're going to do things efficiently and correctly. And just to give you an example uh, and why systems will help with this, if you want to do things efficiently, let's just say that you show up at the job and the water heater is not there. Well, you got to pull off the job and go get a water heater. So you got two guys in a truck that are gone for minimum of three hours, let's say. And so yeah. that throws you off that job and now you don't finish that day. You have to go back the next day. Now you're behind on the job before. So mm-hmm. efficiency is making sure the parts show up, the people show up, that the people are there if it's, or the job is ready for you to show up. Some method so that you're not making uh, mistakes like that. We'll always make mistakes, but there are preventable mistakes that, that can be caught in advance, such as scheduling the wrong place at the wrong time and not having the parts and equipment. And uh, so anyway, being, being efficient is largely a part of having systems and processes so yeah. that you, you know, show up at the right place with the right stuff, get it done in the right amount of time and get on to the next one. Yeah. Well, I, I think again, with what you've said with the scheduling and all that stuff, you know, we talked, we're going to talk about workflow in a little bit. Um, but just understanding all the materials you need way up front, all the steps, every little aspect of a job at the front end will help you to, to bid correctly so that you can stay on budget to schedule correctly so that you can do things efficiently, uh, to help you finish on time. And it's amazing how that stuff is just in contractors heads. Oh yeah. We've got to have this, 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 and it's got to be there. And and it's never communicated. And I forgot the one fitting that connects the whole damn thing together. So I got to go to the store and no, not, I didn't, I mean, I'm speaking as a contractor there. I forgot yeah. the one piece. I got 99%, but the 1% is gone. So now we can't finish. Yeah, exactly. So just having, I mean, honestly, it's really just a checklist. If you think about it in those terms, um, it can get more sophisticated. But if, even if you just have a checklist, it'll make a, a world of difference. Um, just have it written down. So let's talk about constantly reducing waste to become more efficient. Um, I know the the 1% change uh, is a really big one that you have. And there's even a short on it, a uh, short episode that we have, but maybe just give us a little brief uh, version sure. of that. Well, um, the average company in the United States, the average contractor in the United States, if they can get their gross profit margins up 1%, they will increase their net profit by almost 15%, 14.5%. And we have to understand this is not the time to show why that works, but to be aware that 1% makes a 15% different in your net profit. And so yeah. that means that pay attention to the little things they, they do matter. Don't yeah. step over a tube of 12 and let it go into the scrap pile. Take it to the next job. Yeah. It's just a 1% change in like material costs, right? Right. If you can reduce your costs by 1%, which I know probably every contractor can do, oh, you will 100%. profit. You will profit. 15% more roughly. Right. And here's than one. You did if you can reduce your, uh, your variable cost, your cost of getting sold, which is usually labor and, and material. If you can reduce them 2%, you'll increase your net profit 29%. <laughs> it works that yeah. way. And yeah. I think when people are, are aware of that, that the little things matter, it, it, uh, it's worth the time to do the things necessary to manage the little things. And a lot yeah. of people let them go by the wayside because, oh, it's only a hundred bucks. Oh, it's only 1%. Well, that's your 1%. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, uh, let's keep moving on. I want to talk about constraints just briefly. Right. Um, you know, I think a lot of people feel these constraints, especially when they're in that push through phase of just like, man, I, I can't afford to hire more people, but our capacity is, right here and we've got to take on this work or else we're not going to make it. Um, you know, I think that that's a, that's a reality for a lot of contractors out there. And, um, you know, there, there are those constraints that are, you know, 
monetary. There's constraints that are mental as well. Um, and then there's even just the physical constraint of capacity. So right. what do you recommend to contractors that are dealing with constraints well, in in those areas? The, the first thing about constraints, that means a lot of things. Um, but the way we're using it, the way we're talking about it, it means that you have limited capacity and you have to know what that capacity is. And the main reason you have to know that is you have to price your bids accordingly so that you can make money at the capacity you have. Just quickly, if, if you can make $1 a profit on a job, why not take it? That's a dollar you didn't have, right? Well, you can't do an infinite number. Or if you have 400,000 a month in overhead, you can't do 400,000 jobs, which is how many mm-hmm. you have to do just to pay your expense. So we have to understand, you, you simply cannot do enough underpriced work at your limited capacity to pay your overhead expenses and also make a profit. So you have to know what your constraints are, what the limiting factors are so that you bid properly. Then there's another, uh, and we won't go into it too much, but another uh, mention of constraints is uh, maybe you go out to jobs and the thing that's always holding you up is guys digging trenches. Well, that's a constraint that has guys standing around jobs waiting and you need to buy a little track hoe to dig. That's pretty obvious, but so that those are the two kind of straights constraints. One's the big, your total capacity to get things done. Then the other is small individual things like what are my bottlenecks? What are mm-hmm. uh, that constraints? Another word for bottlenecks. What are my bottlenecks that keep me from producing more? And can I produce way more by spending a little more getting rid of that bottleneck? Yeah. What, I mean, what are some of the bottlenecks that you often see? Well, I know some, (laughs) what what do you suggest? Man, I see bottlenecks being, um, a huge one for contractors is just customers. They, their lead generation is solely based on word of mouth and it, it turns their work into seasonal work. It becomes whenever people are thinking about it, that's when they come that and they refer someone to you, that's whenever you get the work. And that's something that can really become a bottleneck for you that if you can't bring people in, you don't have the work to produce and you don't, and if you don't have the work to produce, you can't hire people to do it um, efficiently and your capacity goes way down. But I think um, other constraints that are bottlenecks that people have is, is really just time. Absolutely. I think time is the biggest one where there's too many there's, there's too many things to do and not enough hours to do it. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I think if they can solve that piece of bringing more money in um, and at the right price uh, of, of jobs, you know, making a good margin, then they're going to be able to hire people to give them more time. So well, I think a lot of people listening might be thinking of constraints in terms of tools and equipment, machinery, uh, sure. software that schedules people, those kind of things. And those, those truly are hugely helpful. But like you said, getting customers, another one, and this is probably a constraint in virtually every time is, is a constraint for everybody. The other one's cash. In other words, there are a lot of things I'd like to do. I'd like to have that material pre-bought and sitting on the shop floor and checked out and the missing parts reordered a week before the job goes out, but I don't have the cash. And yeah, I know I'm going to put it on, on an account, but it's still going to be coming due a month or, or a few weeks early. So Mm -hmm. cash is a constraint. And so we always have to be able to make money within the constraints that we have. And we have to improve our efficiency so that we can make, we can reduce those constraints and expand our capacity. Yeah. Well, I think if, and this goes well into the the workflow, but if we're going to, if we're going to be able to improve our efficiencies, you have to be able to map out like the flow of your work so that you know where you can improve. Right. Um, for, for a lot of contractors, it's all in their head and it's, it, they even, you know, it, it's not standardized from job to job. It can change based on what job they're doing and or who's I think doing it. it or who's doing it. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think having a workflow that is really clearly managed, um, and clearly outlined and mapped from the time the job is quoted and designed or whatever, 
all the way to when that final invoice is actually paid and right. beyond that even because there's right. things that happen after the invoice so, you know I, I did a short on how to capitalize on every job um you know there's so much that you can get after the invoice is paid whether that you know for marketing purposes for sales purposes uh whether that's you know referrals or whatever testimonials and then even just from like a service perspective and uh and a leadership perspective getting surveys so having a, a, a map of where the where your project goes from beginning to end will then allow you to become more efficient. Yep. Um, and you like to say who does what by when is workflow, right? Right. Well, people have to know that um, we're uh, we're not helping ourselves or our or our team when they don't have clear expectations of what it is they're supposed to do. And when we talk about workflow, one thing uh, listeners can think of it this way is stand in front of your whiteboard and draw a line, a horizontal line from left to right, and just say everything that goes through one of the jobs you've done. So on the far left, you just write, we've received a phone call and Betty put it in the uh, call him back file and I called him back and then I went out and bid it and then I quoted it and then I got the purchase order and got the contract signed. Then we set a date, then we ordered them the material. Then the material was shipped to us. And then I scheduled it for the guys. And then I sent the guys out on this date. And then how did I know they finished the job? So they give me some kind of piece of paper or something that says I finished the job. Then we invoice and then we call them back every 30 days trying to get our money out of them. And then <laughs> we close the account and then we put them in the marketing loop. So literally a workflow, uh, people can figure it out. Uh, it's a timeline. It's a, it's a timeline. But you draw every step. And when you do that uh, with your team, it's so fun because you can stand up there and draw the things you think. And then somebody behind you will say, hey, we got to put it in the CRM or customer resource management. Where are we going to do that? Oh, we're going to go back here and put enter in the CRM. So we're talking a little bit about how to write systems right now. But that's what a workflow is. And when you spread it out and look at it and then realize, OK, we've got to manage every one of those steps. Um, at, at the highest level, that's meaning, uh, at the most broad level, we've got yeah. to at least identify and manage those steps. That's something everybody can do and you can do Absolutely. it this afternoon and hopefully do it with somebody else present. Cause they'll think of things you don't. Well, I, I like that you said it's a, it's, um, we're getting into systems, but I think every, every, in order to adequately make systems, you can't just look at it from the org chart perspective. Like we'll talk about in a, right. in a second. But you've got to think it from the workflow perspective, because if you just go from like a role or a function and start listing out what they do and then write systems for right. those things, you're going to leave something out. And the workflow is really nice because when you have it all mapped out on a timeline, you're really able to see all the different areas that have to be done yes. uh, to be able to write systems. And just, so, just real quickly on, on a yeah. workflow there, uh, we'll touch on it later, but there's a workflow flow. We're in a workflow that kind of crosses over from sales to doing to admin, mm -hmm. but that is getting your work done workflow. There's also a workflow for your company. Uh, we have regular meetings. We have team meetings. We have mm -hmm. organizational meetings. We have planning meetings. So you can have several workflow lines, but because oh, we're in doing, we'll be just talking about how does, how do we know we got a job? And then all the way to the end, we deposit a check in the bank. So, yeah. And, and yeah, even just in, there's not just one workflow, even in doing the business you have, if you have different services, different products, right. um, you know, different things that you're doing, there's going to be a workflow for each of those. Right. Right. So, um, man, what is, what do you typically see as far as people don't talk about management structure? And I even remember learning this in college and it just going right in one, in one year out the other. Uh, but until I started my own business is when it really made sense <laughs> for me. Um, but what is the, you know, the typical small business you're going to see as hub spoke management. What is hub spoke management? Well, first, every business has a management structure. Oh, absolutely. It's whether intentional you came or not. Up with, yeah, intentional or not. And by far the most common is what we call hub and spoke. And that's uh, you the manager or the owner in the middle. And then every question is like the spokes around a wheel. Everything runs through you. 
it's production questions, it's cash questions, it's uh, yeah. ordering material questions, it's clarification of the contract, it's legal stuff, it's HR, it's IT. Everything runs through you. And, and, and that's okay. I want to I want to emphasize that. That's okay if you do not plan on growing, if you're planning on being a one-man shop and you have no intention of ever leaving your business. Yep. That That's probably the best way to do it if you want to stick in that job. Well, if you want to create a job for yourself, that's probably the best way. Yeah. If you want to, yeah, that, that is how it would be if it's just you because by sure. necessity, but even if you don't anticipate wanting to do something later on, uh, I don't know how old the average listener is, but let me assure you, there might come a time when you think, you know, I'd like to go ahead and make <laughs> money, but not have to do all the work, right? Like you yeah. got your back or broke your ankle or pulled your Achilles tendon has happened to a client of mine. Saw him yesterday and playing soccer blew his out, blew out his Achilles tendon. Well, oh, I didn't realize that was an his Achilles. Yeah. Oh goodness. Yeah, That's like awful. totally, totally screwed, right? For a long time. So, okay, well maybe. So anyway, but Hub and Spoke, two things about that. One is what Khalil just said. You, you, you can't uh, ever grow. Right. Uh, I mean, it's it's always going to be you, and you are completely. Your company is completely constrained, since we've been using that word, by your personal capacity to get things done. So you're never going to get out of the business uh, or ever reach the second part of our goal, a business that works without you. And your business is always going to be limited by your personal capacity to get things done. You can't simultaneously be bidding a million dollar job and also at your bankers trying to get a loan and also out at your attorneys trying to write a contract. You just can't do it. And in, in the meanwhile, directing your guys and ordering materials, you just can't do it. So it's a, it's, it's not the ideal, um, managerial structure. Let's put it that right. way. And so we, you've got a great article that we're, we've got in the show notes, but, um, just talking about more circular management. Right. And, um, really what I want to make a point about with this, you know, the idea is that you have more of a manager function um, and then each department or each area of the business, um, each function of the business has its own role and responsibilities, whether that's multiple people filling those or one person filling multiple roles, but there's its own function that has its own specific things that it does and someone other than you is in charge of it. And yes, it might come back to you eventually, right? Right but you're not the person that's fully managing it. Um, and with that, that allows you to then be pulled out of there uh, because you can find someone to replace that role that you had that isn't responsible for everything, but right. responsible just for the managing. Right. Um, and I know you have some to add to it and I'll come back, but um, what, what do you want to say about circular management? Well, I mean, I literally think of it as a circle and it's useful to do that in a clockwise a way with the owner or the manager at the top, the owner or the manager using systems, which is on the right of the circle, enables the team to take care of the customers, which take care of the business, which take care of the owner or manager. So it is a circular process. And ultimately, as you said, the, the manager can jump up and, and uh, or the owner can step out of the managerial role and begin to do things like think about growing, uh, working on the yeah. business, adding products, getting into different, um, uh, areas. So Markets. working on the business yeah. more than in the business. Yeah. And I, I think what's difficult and why, why I think it's so important to, to join a mastermind or find a coach or, you know, find experts in different areas, you're never going to be able to, be an expert on all these things, but you right. do need to understand all the different areas, all the different things that you can have systems in, at least from a high level, from a 30,000 foot level. Right. And you have to invest in your edu in educating yourself. And really, I, I find that it doesn't happen as well until you are able to pull yourself out because you're so stuck in everything. You're not trying to learn. You're stressed out and you can't learn when you're stressed. Right. And you're back against that time constraint and the time yeah. that you plan to free up on a Friday afternoon turns out you have to go placate a customer who's mad because you got the cracks wrong in his concrete. You know, it, yeah. it, it's just impossible to shake 
free unless you do it with intention and you adjust your managerial style. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about, I mean, we're going to be getting into systems here in a second, really getting di- diving a little bit deeper into it. Let's go over org charts really quick. Sure. How many contractors that you work that you've, you know, met Martin have an org chart? <laughs> well, let's just not limit it to contractors. How many business, just business owners? Have? Yeah. Business owners in a vanishingly small amount. Uh, the people who, who I see who do have an org chart, they did it for a bank or they did it for their investors, or maybe one time they felt a little guilty and thought, well, I need to put together some structure in my company and they sketch something out. But they, even those who do, which I'd say maybe 5% uh, of the contractors and businesses I deal with would have an org chart when I meet them. But even that 5% don't use it. They uh, yeah. don't really know. They said, well, that's interesting. And then they put it in the drawer and, you know, they dust it off two years later and throw it away with the scraps. So really very, very few, uh, have org charts. Yeah. Um, and I think there's just some really key tips that we give and we'll probably have a whole series on org charts, but, um, you, you think that an org chart shouldn't be really where you are at today. Yes, you can do that, but what should your org chart be? Uh, well, when you're, when you're writing a good organizational chart, it should be of your company when it's finished. So uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but an org chart is not arranged by people. And that's one of the great impediments to drawing an org chart. If you have three or four people, you say, well, I'm the boss or the CEO or the president or what, or manager, or whatever you want to put up at the top. And then uh, I've got Bob over there and Bob does sales, but he also does drafting. Uh, he also does the quotes and he also is a project manager. So Bob does all those things. And then I've got Wanda or Bill uh, in the office and he keeps the books and he answers the phone and he puts stuff in the CRM. So, oh, okay. So I got Wanda, Bob and Bill. Well, I'm going to put them all at the same level because I don't want to tell Wanda that she works for Bob. I don't want to put them below because that'll make Bob mad. But Bob kind of does manage Bill, but I don't want to. So anyway, you, you just get frustrated with the exercise, scrap it, throw it away. So the two things about an org chart are that it is not organized by people. It's organized by function. And it is organized the way you want your business to be done uh, or to look what you want your business to look like when it's done. And I know your business is never going to be done. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. hopefully you just keep going and getting better, better. But from where yeah. you are today, man, if I had a business that looked like this, it would be great. So right. th- those are kind of the two overarching things about uh, org charts. Yeah. Well, good. Cause I think, you know, we talk here in a little bit about how that, how essential an org chart is to your systems, um, and building systems. So let's dig deep into this a little bit. Okay. I know that we've already gone a long time for this episode, but I, I really do think that this is such a incredible thing and it's so simple, but so difficult at the same time. Um, systems, right. um, at the heart, it's really just removing yourself from the company, making sure things are done properly uh, to a standard that you know you you can see that standard in every single job. But then it's putting that standard, new standards on all of your company on every aspect, right. um, and it becomes that you know step by step instruction, right? Right. That that owner's manual essentially of the franchise. Um, that's why va- franchises are so valuable because they come with systems. Um, and you know, I want to put a link in the show notes to the, the Big Mac example. You've seen it, right, Martin? Right. Oh yeah. I'm not, yeah, I'm not good. sure we can do that. That might be copyrighted, no. but it's certainly worth talking about. Oh gosh. I mean, it is so cool. Just, I mean, it's almost, it's overboard in, in some respects, but not really. I mean, it's, it's just every little detail about how you place the pickles and how you put on the ketchup and, right you know, the special sauce and all these different things completely outlined to where literally you can hire someone in high school and they could do it. And that's literally what they do. Right. 
Um, so diving deeper into systems, I know that there are several questions that you've kind of outlined here that you, that contractors should be asking themselves about systems. So why don't you ask well, us some I of mean, these questions, can, Martin? What, what we're after is consistency in the result. You know, that's the on time, on, on budget and on quality, but how do we do that? And, uh, the consistency of the result. And so part of what systems do for you is how do your employees know what they're supposed to do? I mean, how do they know? They show up at eight every day or do you send them out on some software and they get it on a tablet? But literally, how do they know what they're supposed to do? How do they know when they're, when they're supposed to do it? How do they know, uh, that how they'll be measured? In other words, uh, how well do they have to, to do things? I want to, mentioned really quickly, we talked about quality uh, a little earlier, or we mentioned it. Quality means suitability to the intended purpose. So if they paid for a Volkswagen, you don't deliver them a Range Rover. Quality for that job means uh, Volkswagen. How do your employees know the level of quality? How does your office know when your employees are done and it's time to invoice? How do you know when to deliver parts what parts to deliver and how and where to deliver them and how do you keep customers and other stakeholders in in the loop on what's going on how do how do we manage their expectations as we go on and then as you since you began your contractor business to wherever you are in your contractor journey you're almost certainly better than you were before so that means that you found ways to do things more efficiently more effectively more cost effectively. So how do you gather those best practices or your improvements and pass them on and disseminate them through your organization? So these are all the kind of things that systems answer for you. And if they're written systems, which they are, <laughs> otherwise they're not system, but checklists and processes and how to's, if they're written, you don't have to explain it to every new hire that comes in the door. You at the very least have a curriculum so that you can so, say, a guy needs to know how to drive a forklift, needs to be certified and have his card for that. Needs to be OSHA certified, needs to be an apprentice card, electrician, whatever it is. But you at least have a curriculum at the minimum. At the best, you almost don't have to say anything. They can learn their job uh, online, watching videos, or by the materials that you have in files and they can learn it, uh, can be instructions on the job at the time they're doing the job. So these are all the kind of things that systems answer. And in particular, they answer the question, how are you supposed to get any sleep at night? Because <laughs> if you're trying to keep it all in your head, that's not gonna happen. Khalil? Hello? Can you not hear me? No, I can. Right oh, now. I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, it, it's a never ending process um, creating systems. I mean, there's always something to be created. And that's why I think it's important to have it as a part of your culture, uh, your company, for people to to write down their systems, to think about it in terms of systems, to think about training their other employees, to think about firing themselves from little jobs um, and getting promoted and those things like, like that. Um, but just you're not able to keep it all straight. I mean, yes, if you're small enough, you probably can. If you're not planning on growing, you can probably keep it in your head and be fine. But if you are planning to grow, it, it doesn't work. You're, you're going to be too stressed out. You're not going to sleep. And I've had, as a business owner, I've had nights like that where it's like, there's so much going on. Like, I don't even know what yeah, to do. What am I forgetting? Yeah. What am I forgetting? When you, when you have systems and processes, all you have to remember is let's just, it's the simplest say, put it in my calendar, put it in yep. your calendar and it's out of my head. It's out of your head. Yep. I just, all I know is I got to look at my calendar every five hours. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So let's, let's go into some examples, right? So if people are going to create systems, um, give us an example of, you know, what that would help with. 
um, an example that might be able to, you know, make it a little bit more concrete for people? Well, I think we have to start with the idea of a, of a proper org chart. And, and I said, org charts, you don't create them by people. You forget individuals. Don't even talk about it. Don't even think about people. Think about what goes on in your business. So you obviously have a leadership function. That's a little bit abstract. It's not abstract. It's very real in its effects. But a lot of people don't walk around thinking about leadership. But for the time being, we'll just say you have a leadership function. We have a sales function and a marketing function. Uh, you have a production function and you have administrative functions. Surprise, surprise. Those are the four things every business does. Your org chart has to account for those things. Guiding the business, getting the business, doing the business and administering the business. So let's just say we drew out an org chart and we had those, uh, we call them a CEO, chief executive officer, a CMO, a chief marketing officer, a COO, a chief operations officer, and a CFO, a chief financial officer. Now, a lot of contractors don't use those C-level terms, but it doesn't matter. Just so you've got an org chart organized that way. Well, you look at those various functions and say, well, in the underneath the chief operating officer, uh, somebody has to be an uh, engineer or a CAD, a CAD draftsman or engineering for design. Somebody has to do quotes, which might be in sales, might be in production. Somebody has to order material. Somebody has to schedule the work. Now, maybe that's all just one person, but maybe you have a job scheduler you have crew chiefs or project management, you have a materials procurement department. So underneath your operations, you have three other boxes, which are project manager, uh, procurement, and uh, well, I don't remember what the other one was. But once you do that and you think it through, uh, when you start your business and it's just you, your org chart still looks that way. It just so happens that your name, the owner, is in every box on the chart. So, right. So you, you still create the chart by function. These are the things, a receptionist, the bookkeeper, okay. Over in his HR department, it guy, right. Over in the administrative part, I have all those functions. It's just that I do them all. It's me. Yeah. Right. It's me. And so once you have that org chart and the boxes on there of the different functions, um, and by the way, if you have five project managers, you don't need five boxes one box because the project manager position is the same, right? I have people right. sometimes write them in that they got 10 bookkeepers. They put 10 boxes, bookkeeper went, no, 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 not unless they're functionally different. Uh, so anyway, that's where it starts. And so now you have a look at the positions uh, or the functions that you have in the business. And then, as we said earlier, uh, to help you a little bit, you need to draw a timeline so that you can see the kind of things that happen. Yeah. Go on. Uh, and then you look at your uh, org chart that you, and you look at, at a, um, at a box and let's just take bookkeeping because that's real simple for me. Uh, you say, what's a bookkeeper have to do? So you make bullet points underneath that box. Bookkeeper yeah. does invoicing. Bookkeeper receives payments against invoices. Bookkeeper enters bills. Bookkeeper pays bills. Bookkeeper reconciles the uh, checking account, right? Uh, by the way, bookkeepers, you need to control that. So, but, but we're just talking here. Separate people managing, uh, receiving money and paying bills and so forth. Right. But I just want to get, put that you were getting hinting, hinting at embezzlement. Right. I'm, I'll, I'll be explicit. Yes. You don't want to get ripped <laughs> off. It has happened to me twice. Huge, huge amounts, very damaging. But anyway, uh, but anyway, those are the functions of a bookkeeper. Uh, payroll be, might be another function of the bookkeeper, might be HR department. But anyway, you just bullet point the things from your timeline that that person does. If you have right. a salesman, What's the salesman supposed to do? Well, he's prospecting for leads. Uh, he's entering data into the CRM. He's following up. He's doing maybe maybe they uh, take out samples and give demonstrations, but they're responsible for quotes and bids. Maybe they're pricing. They're responsible for following up. You know, when you send a bid out, and you don't hear anything for two weeks. So 
Uh, he's supposed to write sales order and somehow he or she is supposed to communicate to the people who have to do it, what it was he or she sold. So yeah. now you can see you're starting to have an org chart with a bunch of bullet points under each box, right? So uh, basically that's the, the structure. If, if we were to tell people or suggest to people and say, okay, take the weekend and go systemize your business. Well, from experience, I just say that is not going to happen. But even <laughs> if you did it, it would be pretty poor because a lot of things are going to pop up that you didn't think about. And, and just, it's very hard to systemize a business at one fell swoop. It can be done, right. but I've just never seen it done. So I'm saying get well, ready. And, and that's why I think it has to become more of a habit of right. systemizing. And then it also has your, your org chart should be a living, breathing thing. Right. Um, not just something that you, yeah, we've got an org chart. Right. Oh, yeah. It's in there somewhere. It's on the, it's on our, it's in the cloud. Well, we've, we've already seen one way that you're using the org chart. You're using the org chart to collect processes like invoicing, receiving payments, mm -hmm. entering bill. Each one of those is a process. So you've collected a group of processes below a function in your business. And if you circle that, you have the beginnings of a job description. So when you're looking for somebody and they come in and they say, what do you want me to do? I mean, what, what, what's the job? Well, you're the bookkeeper. You're expected to do these things. Invoice, receive payments, yep. enter bills, pay bills, do payroll, reconcile the bank accounts, uh, do correspondence, you know, collect late payment. This is what you're expected to do. Well, that's not a job description right there, but that's better than most people get, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so anyway, then the next step, which I guess we'll get onto here pretty soon, is but fleshing those out. Yeah, for sure. So... You were given the example of a salesperson, of a bookkeeper. Uh, we know uh, inside of an org chart why that makes sense um, for those those functions. Now, we, so we've got our org chart at the top, then we've got functions underneath it. And then for each function, we want to go and bullet point all the things they do. So like for the salesperson, they've we, we know that one of the functions that they do uh, is sales orders. So for the sales orders, the things that they've got to do for that system, they've got to have the due date. They've got to have the materials, the man hours, the colors that are requested by the customer, the install instructions, contact info for the customer, notes on the customer, the customer's address, any special items for right. the project. Right. Um, you know, everything they need to know to deliver what you promised or what you sold, they've got to have on that sales order. Right. And now... You, can you have all those things bullet pointed out. You can go and flesh each one of those points out, right? right? So, um, yeah. Well, by fleshing it out, you know, uh, how do you create a materials list? You can have check yep. box so that you're not, you know, you got the major materials, but you forgot the fasteners, and things like that. Um, how do they estimate, you know, the man hours? Uh, that's mm -hmm. one thing you can do to increase efficiency is tell the people doing the work what you estimated as the uh, hours. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't know they're just going to have to do the job if you've got well there are all kinds of things you can do with that and any programs and others but yeah you you then begin to refine the bullet points uh to the point that they know exactly what to do and in your example of a sales order one of the things are where is the sales order well it's in google drive under sales under sales orders commercial so that you know where it is, you can go get it and fill it out. Well, if I'm a new employee coming in, you say, fill out the sales order. That's the first thing I want to know. Where is it? Yeah. So it's that level of instruction as you flesh out the bullet points so that people could actually do the task or the process that you're assigning to them. Yeah. Well, you know, this is something that we're going to have to cover over several episodes. It's something that we'll always refer back to. And it's helpful to know this area of doing the business and what we mean by that in order to, you know, go back and reference when we talk about something, right. uh, know exactly what we're talking about. So I know that this has been all over the place. It is a fire hydrant um, instead of a faucet uh, as far as information goes. And it's, it, don't worry if this is something that stresses you out or feels overwhelming because it literally take, it's something that you're always going to have to work on. 
It's not something that you learn overnight. It's literally a lifetime's worth of knowledge. Well, I have um, a uh, man that will put in his show notes. One of my Mount Rushmore things is Touchstone Business Systems. And they have software where you create your org chart online on the cloud. And then you build your mm -hmm. systems and processes within that org chart. Somebody can click on their position, go down to systems and processes, pick the system and process, all the videos, forms, all that kind of thing are right there. And you don't even have to know about it. But one of the things that his name is Michael Mills, the owner of that company. One of the things that he says is systemization is a manner of thinking. In other words, if the first thing that when somebody presents you a problem, if the first thing that you think about is what am I going to do about that? That's the lowest level of, of management sophistication. The next level up is what resources do I have to deploy to take care of that? Uh, so I don't have to. And then the highest level is what systems and processes do we have so that people can read and take care of that problem and we can avoid it forevermore in the future. So, you progress from what am I going to do to what am, what am I going to get somebody else to do to how do we have systems and processes so somebody else can do it without, let's just say, without me even knowing about it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So that's a good point. We can go into our Mount Rushmore segment. And I think, what is our, uh, I think it's this one. Oh, there we, we got to go. get that Mount protocol Rushmore. down. We need a system for that. Have you got a system? We do, for that? We do need a system. Yeah, for, that. for our music. Yeah. Okay. So Mount Rushmore, top four things. Uh, we'll choose a George Washington. Today's Mount Rushmore segment is about tools to help you with processes. Martin already cheated. Started the segment early. His first one yeah. was no, Touchstone. That, it's not cheating. Okay. Well, Touchstone was one of yours. I'll let since you were ready to jump the gun, Boomer Sooner. I'll let you, uh, sooner, not I'll let, <laughs> I'll let you go ahead and, and list the rest of your four. Okay. One of the most important, we're talking about systemization here, uh, yeah. as, as the big main point of what we're talking about today. And it's that touchstone business systems, uh, you can find them online and we'll have their link. Uh, but they have the uh, cloud-based system to do everything we were just talking about today and remove some of the confusion of just hearing about it and changing it over to hands-on, click here, do that, leads you through it. They have great training programs. Systemization itself is a system. Uh, you create systems systematically. Uh, the other thing is project managers, uh, as in people, but such a, such a benefit, a good project manager who takes that whole burden of chaos off your plate uh, we haven't talked about it today, but I'm still going to talk about a default calendar. A default calendar is a, I've, I've heard it referred to as a block time calendar, but I have a contractor friend here in my hometown who is never in his office from noon to five on Fridays, except that he is. And I promise you, if you call him noon to five on Friday, you're not going to talk to him. And that's his right. time he's got blocked off where he's working on his business, things like creating systems. And so a default calendar is a great tool to free up time to do the things that you need to. And another is uh, Trello cards. Uh, we'll have the link uh, in the uh, show notes for that. Trello cards are a, a method of managing projects. That's really simple. The startup on it is free, but you create a visual method to track where you are on a timeline, such as the one we talked about. It's really powerful, starts out free, even if you pay, it's not very much. So that's it. Those are my four. Good stuff. Yeah, Trello is super helpful for uh, building workflows. Um, and then you can even enter a, make a project and throw it into the workflow and it literally needs to be dragged from step to step right. to step. And everybody can see it in the cloud, on their phone, on their computer, whatever. Yeah, you visually so, see what's going on. Yeah. So, okay, my four things, uh, my, my Mount Rushmore, of tools with processes. First one, I really love Loom, L-O-O-M. Um, really cool, especially, you know, we do a lot of work on the computer. I know not a lot of contractors do, but they do have to do bookkeeping and maybe even some of their bidding, um, some of their sales functions as well. So uh, Loom is going to allow you to share your screen and do video 
uh, of yourself at the same time and allow you to record it. And then it gives you a link that goes into the cloud and then you can send that link to anybody. And so what, you know, we use Loom a lot, whether we're doing sales and sending videos to customers or clients, uh, also for systems, if we need to show somebody how to do something, we just make a Loom and it's, it's become really great because we'll get a question and rather than just give the answer, we go and we record a Loom and show someone how to do it. Um, Another equivalent of this is a voice memos. I've used that in the past, but voice memos is a really great tool on your iPhone um, or any kind of recording device on your on your phone. Just record what you want done in the system. Don't make it too difficult yourself. If you if you hate being on Word or on a Google Doc and typing things out, just put it onto a voice memo and list out all the things that need to be done for a, a job function or a, a system for a process. So. Uh, that's my biggest one is just recording things. The next is, you know, far and beyond the most used tool on our team, um, and should be for anybody, but it's Google drive really just makes it so easy to use things in the cloud, to organize, to keep everybody in the loop, um, you know, edit documents in real time and let people see those changes in real time. Um, it just really reduces the clutter for us. Um, the next tool, Martin kind of used it with project managers, but honestly, the best tool to help with processes is just to have a right-hand man, to have somebody that's right next to you that is a little bit more detailed oriented and is ready to help with any of these systems and processes. As you have an idea, as you have something that needs to be done, you can you can give that to the right-hand man and then let them take care of it. Um if you're a small contractor and you're trying to get started or trying to get better at, at systems, find a right hand man. You you won't regret it. Um, and then my last one is also Trello. We actually use Asana. It's a different version, uh, but basically any project management software. I know for some um, contractors it's Jobber or Builder Trend or Service Trade. Uh, there's several out there, but any sort of project management software will help you stay organized keep things in place and then allow it, make it a lot easier to develop systems around that software. So, um, those are my four. What's your George Washington, Martin? Touchstone business. I knew it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, w- I would say mine's Google drive. Um, man, if, if you're still sending word documents back and forth and doing invoices through there and all that stuff, get onto Google drive. You won't regret it. Um, there is a little learning curve up front, just like with anything, but do it for two weeks and you'll never turn back. So um, we've got our next segment, which is quote of the day. Martin, you want to hit us with the quote of the day? Yeah, I love this from Edward Deming. He said, you cannot manage what you do not measure. Okay. Well, systems provide a means to measure and to communicate what those measurements are and a means to review them so that you manage. If you don't manage your business, everything that happens to you is an accident and you might get lucky and thrive, but, but probably not. So that's, that's one of my favorite quotes. You cannot manage what you do not measure. Okay. Excellent. Um, I love that really great. And it's hard to measure. There's so many things you can measure, but just start making small steps, um, measure something and then slowly build on it. Uh, and it'll, it'll change the way that you run your business. Okay. Uh, the favorite segment, right? Something you can actually go do. We just gave them a fire hydrant. We just showered everybody with all this information and we didn't dive deep enough on any of them. Uh, but this is just an overview. So what's something people can actually go do? Let's get our music really quick. Uh, there we go. There go. Are so, you writing that down, Ethan? <laughs> that's your responsibility. That, that's a, it's a hey different, guys, t- it's a different when every you're, time. When you're creating a system, a lot of times just go through your day and write down what you're doing. And if you, <laughs> if you did a good day that day, uh, there's a system for you and you can begin to there you go. go ahead. So there you there go. There's you something go. you can actually do. <laughs> yeah. That's not what I plan yeah. to say, but write down what you do one day, write down the processes of a job. Okay. Well, let's, what's something they can go do like right now? Like, okay. Put down this podcast. What can you do in the next? Take out a piece of paper because I'm old and I still talk about paper and pencil Mm -hmm. and draw it an org chart. Think about the individual functions in your business 
and draw an organizational chart and get started with that. The second thing you can do is draw that line, that horizontal left to right line of a workflow of a job and just write down the steps that go into that job. Then look at the org chart, but draw the org chart to a workflow. Yeah. Do do the cover all the areas. It's don't think that it, remember it's a living and breathing thing. It's going to change. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just do your best to cover all the functions that you can think of in your org chart. Do it by function, not by people. Um, and then if you want to look at the show notes for an example and an article, um, and you'll, it'll help you out just a little bit. So, um, yeah, go draw an org chart. Um, so you had talked about at the beginning of the episode, Martin, the, um, forgetting his name already, Derek Seavers. but yeah, Derek Seavers. So he had CD baby or whatever his company was. And you had, you told us that after 30 days, there were crickets and he had no more questions because yeah. he was basically calling people out in front of everybody for asking questions. Um, and I know you said that he ended up selling to Apple for millions of dollars, but what, um, well, we what ended up happening him, with those employees? We left him sitting in his office and it's a good point to make a distinction between delegation and abdication. Uh, when you delegate, you create systems and processes and hold people accountable and get them to do things for you. What Derek did in fact was abdicate. He walked out into the warehouse, still on his soapbox, said, I don't want to hear this question anymore. And, and it worked. The problem was that he gave his employees, uh, in essence, control of his company. And it wound up they voted themselves 100% of the profits. And anyway, they, they took the company and he had to uh, sue them to get it back. So while he did unload all his duties, he didn't do it the right way. And it cost him. He did get his company back. And when he sold it to Apple, he put most of the money in a charity. So that's the kind of guy he is. But if you're going to systemize and process and delegate, you have to make sure that you're delegating and not abdicating. But that's a great book, Anything You Want by Derek Sievers. And it's a fun read. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, yeah, we've got tons of resources in the show notes for you. If you ever have questions, you can definitely reach out to us. Um, and then before we leave, we do have to do our last segment, uh, which I'm really excited about today because we went pretty long and we covered a lot of things. Ethan, are you ready for this? Yep. Yep. Got some good stuff. Okay. Well, uh, let's get your music going. We'll put uh, 60 seconds on the clock for you today. I'll give you 90 you, seconds. Ethan, the intern. Okay. You should get 90, 90 seconds. seconds. <laughs> 90 seconds. Today. Okay. Are you, are you ready, Ethan? Yep. All righty. Let's do this. Go. All right. Doing the business means delivering whatever you so it is you sold. Uh, the biggest problem Martin sees is chaos in the mind, which means the owner has too many tasks on his, his or her mind, and they must delegate this to trusted employees. Uh, performance means delivering what you sold on time, on budget, as promised. Uh, when you hire, don't just hire to fill a space. Hire for talent and skill. Uh, when you're thinking of time, set expectations and manage them early. Under-promise, but over-deliver. Over-promising can lead to many headaches. Um, budget. You're you're not bidding to get you're not bidding to get a job. You're bidding for profit. Uh, two constraints you might see are uh, you must know your capacity so you can bid correctly, and you have to ask yourself, what are my bottlenecks that keep me from producing more? An org chart should be created. Uh, by people or no by function not people and you should have one for your whole company not for now but for when it's finished um systems don't try to keep all your systems in your head uh, write them down uh, create systems for every position in your organization detail every task or process each position may encounter um make a default calendar which means marking off times where you don't work in the business but rather you work on the business uh Make systems with videos or voice memos if you can't write them down. Uh, Loom is a great way to do that. And find a right-hand man. Cool. Okay, I think that is 90 seconds. Well done. Cool. Was that 90 seconds? I did. Um, I've got one edit i got to make because I just I did a short on it. 
you do hire for skill and talent, but you also hire for attitude and behavior. I was about to say that. Yeah, yeah. we can yeah. I, I don't think I said that. That's not your fault, Ethan, but that's an important. Right. Well, basically, don't just hire somebody because they're a buddy. Uh, make sure that they're competent too. Well, yeah, and don't just hire somebody because they can do it. If they come in and they uh, right. have a bad attitude, don't show I up. I, trauma, I have rude. another point on that. Yeah. It was, I have another point on hiring. Oh. It was hiring a new employee is not always the answer. It could lead to more problems. So. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, lots covered today. Excited to, you know, we've got one other episode here about administering the business, which is, I, I'm going to guess, probably the most uh, overwhelming for uh, contractors, um, but, and really any business owner, but, I'm, I am excited to dive deeper into all of these uh, moving forward after these overview episodes of the four years of business. But thanks for your time, Martin. Thanks, Ethan, for helping yes, out. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in the next one. guys. Talk to you later. Thanks for listening to The Cashflow Contractor. Check out our website in the show notes or visit thecashflowcontractor.com. What's up, Cashflow Contractors? Khalil here. Thank you so much for getting to the end of this episode. It means the world to us that you're listening. Uh, I've got a favor to ask. So we are looking for contractors who would like to have a consult, a free consult with myself and with Martin um, for about 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, we'll basically just ask you questions about your business, about what it's like for you to work as a contractor, and then we will answer any of your questions specific to your business. Then we'll make that a live episode for other contractors to learn from, to engage with. Uh, and we think it's a great way for people to really see clear, uh, specific answers to problems that contractors have. So if that interests you at all, we're not going to share any of your information. Um, we, you don't even need to say your name on the episode. But I think we want to get some more of these episodes out there. And if you're willing to do that, we've got a link in the show notes that allows you to just submit a form for a consult, then we'll schedule it with you and record it, and we'll put you live on, on uh, the podcast. So if that interests you, please check it out in the show notes. If not, no worries. Or if you know someone else that you think would be interested in it, send it to them. That'd be great. But appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, we hope that you're finding less stress, more time, and more money. Thanks.